Hello, and welcome to Evolutionary Parenting with Tracy Castles, PhD. I'm Tracy, and today I'm going to start a series entitled The Science of Sleep Training, which will focus on individual discussions of the studies that are involved or looking at sleep training. Now this week we'll start with one that most of you have probably heard of by Dr. Anna Price and colleagues in the journal Pediatrics entitled Five-Year Follow-Up of Harms and Benefits of Behavioral Infant Sleep Intervention Randomized Trial. Now this is the long-term follow-up study that many advocates of extinction sleep training methods use to justify the idea that there is no long-term harm to anyone. The gist of what they found was that in a long-term five-year follow-up of children who had either been exposed to an intervention promoting sleep training or a control group, there were no differences between the groups in sleep problems, child well-being, parent-child relationships, and chronic stress between the two groups. So let's start with the big pro of this study and why it gets a lot of attention, the randomized trial. Prior to this larger sleep study, most did not have an appropriate control group, which made any comparisons almost meaningless. Now, not only did this intervention have a control group, but they managed to randomize assignment to it, much the way they did during the probit breastfeeding study in Belarus, which is considered the gold star for breastfeeding research. For those that don't know and are thinking people could be forced to do sleep training or breastfeeding, the way the randomization goes for these studies is that people are randomly assigned to an intervention or control group, and those in the intervention group are given information about the intervention in hopes that it will increase the rate of people who use it. In this particular study, this intervention consisted of, amongst other things, the promotion of modified extinction sleep training, or controlled crying, as one possible action parents could take. Now, despite this, there were flaws that we must look at for they severely limit what we can take from this study. So first, there are concerns with the assessment of most of the variables. The researchers almost exclusively used parental report for their child-centered variables, which inherently limits their validity. Now, this was the case for the assessment of sleep problems and all child-related well-being variables, with the exception of health, pardon me, health-related quality of life and saliva cortisol levels. Now, this offers us not an objective measure of these variables, but rather the parent's perception of these variables. Why does this matter? Because the presumption is that the effects of sleep training would be on the child, but any positive bias would come from the parent because they are the ones who instigated and completed the sleep training protocol. Now, it's common to see people report positive results from an intervention, not because there are actually any objective positive results, but because of feelings of self-efficacy that come with having actually done something. Now, second, the assessment of chronic stress was done via saliva cortisol levels measured during one day. An appropriate measure, but the way in which they categorized abnormal patterns to indicate stress is somewhat questionable. So the researchers considered two patterns abnormal, either stress that started low and stayed low throughout the day or started high and stayed high. Now these are atypical cortisol responses, but the question is what they're actually linked to. So there is a bit of evidence that the lack of a decline in cortisol throughout the day is linked to total cortisol levels during times of stress. However, the more robust finding for chronic stress pertains to awakening cortisol levels. That is, Individuals identified as having chronic stress through a variety of measures have been found to have higher morning levels of cortisol compared to those who do not have chronic stress, but later patterns in the day do not necessarily differ. Thus, awakening cortisol is considered a potential biomarker for chronic stress. Now, what does this mean for this particular study? Well, we don't know, as this particular information wasn't provided. But we also don't know if this biomarker would be the same for children, the subjects being measured here. Instead, we only have the comparison of the percentages in each group who met the definition of abnormal cortisol patterns defined by the researchers. For this, there were 28.8% in the intervention group and 21.7% in the control group who met that criteria, and this difference was not statistically significant. Now, the final problem I want to discuss here is, the pos is possibly the largest and has to do with the way in which they approach their randomization and the subsequent analyses for this randomization. As I said earlier, the randomization is generally positive when done properly. The problem here is that there are a few flaws that make this randomization less than ideal. So let's start with the fact that there was no oversight for the control group. Families in this group were given a meeting with a nurse, but there was no accounting for what the nurse actually said to them. 
Now, given that many medical professionals have been known to promote extinction sleep training methods, it's possible that some or even many families in the control group received this advice anyway. The next problem is that the intervention group actually offered multiple strategies of which controlled crying was just one. Families were able to select which strategies they wished to employ. Of the 174 families in the intervention group, only 100 actually met with the nurse to discuss sleep and select an intervention, but there is no data as to which of the methods they chose to embark on. Of the families in the control group, we have absolutely no idea what any of the families did. Now this brings us to the last problem I wish to discuss. Yes, there are more for the sake of time, but I'll end here, and that is the analyses. The researchers chose the intention to treat method of analyses, which is very common in medicine, as it allows us to ignore differences between groups that likely have nothing to do with the actual intervention. However, in this case, it's unlikely that the differences have nothing to do with the intervention and the lack of data on the actual use of methods for those in the control group. Now, intention to treat models provide data on the efficacy of any intervention, not specific interventions. Thus, we must be clear that earlier research from this group promoting their intervention as effective was not about the actual methods used, but about offering any intervention to families. And this can speak to the bias that I mentioned above on parents feeling better when they actually do something. However, here we also have a problem, because if we think about how this research is based on a lack of differences between the intervention and control groups at this five-year follow-up, then we have to look at how different these groups likely are. Now we know that just over half in the intervention group chose any intervention to implement, and can probably assume that some did not choose controlled crying as their method. Now it's a guess, but it seems reasonable to assume that half the families, approximately, engaged in controlled crying when their infants were young in the intervention group. In the control group, we have no data at all. We do, however, have data on how frequently families engage in controlled crying, and that rate is around 50%. That is, approximately 50% of families choose to try controlled crying independent of any study or intervention. Now, if you're doing the math, this means you can hopefully see that when we actually compare the groups, it's quite possible that we have very similar groups in terms of the intervention. If around 50% of families in each group engaged in controlled crying or a similar variant, then we're looking at the potential long-term effects of two groups that are the same. Now, this is why the key to such randomized trials is to actually assess how well it worked to get people to engage in the intervention. So, here we have it. A study that is often cited to support the safety of sleep training, but hopefully you can see now that that's a little more than disingenuous and doesn't tell us much about the long-term global effects, much less any effects based on things like temperament. So proof of no harm? I don't think so.